we, hey, good morning, everyone. Good, good morning. to be with you. Hey, I want to start this off with a word of prayer. Really looking forward to, uh, to getting into this with you guys and just studying God's word together. Um, it's going to be a little change of pace from where you guys have been with, with Hugh. Um, the, the goal for John is going to be a bit of scholarly meeting where we're at personally. And what I'm really hoping for is that this can be a place where, where we gain some knowledge on the book of John, um, some scholarly things. But for me, scholarly, it's, it's nice, but if it doesn't go from head to heart, it's not really worth it, you know? So we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to really be moving in our hearts and in our lives. You know, the same spirit that wrote the book of John through John is the same spirit that lives in us today. And I really believe that he wants us to connect with his truth. Um, he wants us to connect with his words on those things. And so we're just going to pray that. We're going to pray. We're going to open up our lives and our minds and our hearts, really, to, to these words and to the authority of Scripture. So let's jump in. Oh, God, you're good. And, and the way in which you love us is, is so amazing, Lord. Lord, I thank you so much for just how great you are, how much higher and exalted you are than, than a human being could ever be. Lord, and uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this special, special book that teaches us so much, Lord, that you've revealed yourself through story. Lord, and I'm just really looking forward to getting in this. Lord, as we do this, we invite your Holy Spirit here. Open up our hearts and our minds. Lord, would you help us as we read through your truth to connect with it and not just gain knowledge about it, but Lord, would you allow us to allow it to form us, allow it to affect and change the way that we view things, the way that we live, the things that are going on in the insides of us, Lord. We, we open that up to be challenged and changed and moved by the goodness of you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to do a little introduction to myself, but before we do that, I want to get a little introduction from you guys, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to share your name, your first and your last, and maybe we can work it like uh, by, by next time we have a little Friday. Maybe you guys make a little name tag, you know what I'm saying, in front of your, front of your thing. You fold a sheet of paper and make it pretty so that, you know, it's just going to help me remember your name and get them quicker. Um, but I want to hear your name. I want to hear your age. I want to hear where you're from. And then I want to hear your favorite, if you had to pick only one type of food by country, what country are you choosing? Okay. Hey, America is on the table, but we got things like China, Italy, France. I don't know whatever else creative you can think of cuisine from one country. So I'm looking for name, age, home location, and cuisine, and that would be great. All right, hey, who's going to go first? Yeah, right here. My name is Colby Tracy. Colby, nice to meet you. Hey, I want to hear from Colby over here. Like it? Hey, Colby, I'd like you to pick someone else in the room. Uh, I'm going to pick Seth. Seth. Right. I don't agree with him at all. Um, <laughs> Seth, my name is Seth Beal. Um, I'm 18. I'm from Minnesota. Um, and uh, all of Asian cuisine, real Asian cuisine, I would say is the best. Panda sucks. Asian is not a country. Well, I know what you're so bad <laughs> Yes, country. Oh, my God. I know. I know, it's hard. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Hey, would, would you pick, would you pick another person, please? Yeah. All right, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you. South Korea. Mm. Very nice. All right, who are we calling on? Oh, uh, 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 u
Hey, Hayden. Um, 31. Yeah. 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 There we go, Hayden. Hayden, pick someone for me. Okay, I'm Lily. Well, Leona Barto. Um, 22 from Alaska, and my favorite food would probably be Japanese. Nice. Nice. Who would you like to call him? Oh, sick. Yeah, pretty sick, actually. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'd have to say African. Wow. Like, like specifically Ethiopia. Yeah. Ethiopia. Very nice. Yeah. Tell me if you find an Ethiopian place on Kauai. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen them. There's a really good one in Portland. Ah, so sick. I'll take that we'll fly in. All right, who's next? Uh, I'm Hook, Daniel Schaefer, Washington State, Matthew C. Gives me double one. And I'm 18, and now I feel like Mexico. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a solid choice. All right, call someone else. Uh, Jap Japan, yeah. Hey, that's good. All right, who's next? You get to call. Yeah, high five him. He, he was waiting for you. <laughs> then he left you hanging. Indian, that way. Who are we picking? Who's next? <laughs> and um, probably a mix between Chinese and um, Japan, so China, Japan. Okay, you got to pick a country, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot mix. All right, excuse me, Japan. Japan, there it is. Uh, all right, Trent, take it away. All right, my name is Trent Hall. I'm 22. I'm from San Diego, California. Yeah. Boy. There's a good little Italy in San Diego, isn't there? Sweet. <laughs> Who's next? Awesome. There you go. Oh, yeah. We, we didn't let him get away with it. We're not letting you get away with it. Hey, we're sticklers here. Oh, out of way. <laughs> All right, who's next? Who's next? Home, hometown? Sick. Cool. Who's next? You guys need a field trip to Kintaro's? <laughs> Heck yeah. That's, that's the great Japanese food on Kauai.
Nice. All right, we got a few more people. If you haven't been called on yet, could you raise up your hands? Okay. Who's next? Uh, yeah. oh, don't you worry. Okay. My name is Maddie Kate. My full name is Madison. I am 19. Uh, I'm from Medford, Oregon, and my favorite cuisine is probably Hawaiian. Hawaiian. There we go. That's not a country. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's an American, but Hawaiian. <laughs> Some people think it's a, it's a country. Um, who's next? Oh, yeah. Sweet. Who else? Who else are we waiting on? Is that everybody? No, we're missing two, four, five people. All right, there you go. America. Solid. <laughs> all right, next up, pick our next. Who's next? Who's left? Raise your hand. Oh, Two. Maddie Drake. I did. I've met you once. <laughs> You and I together in Mexico, Maddie. <laughs> Excellent. Not Canadian. <laughs> You're done with your country, huh? <laughs> I've had I've had poutine in Canada and it was wild. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys for sharing those things. Um, hey, I I know there's a big group of you guys, um, but we also don't want to group you guys all as being the same person, you know. And uh, it's going to take us some time as staffers to get to know you guys individually. But you know, we're we're just so psyched for each and every person that's here you know, and, and to get into it. A um, little bit about me. I'll give you a brief synopsis of my testimony. I, I grew up in a Christian family. My dad's actually in the back there. That's Pops. He's, uh, he's flying out today back to Wisconsin, unfortunately. Everyone give a, oh. So I grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, I came out to Quiet Christian Fellowship in 2010 on an internship, and uh, did one year away back to finish my undergraduate school, which is at Crown College outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah, see. And um, then I came right back here and started working full time with the high school kids at, at KCF. And um, man, God has, has brought me from things to things that I never would have expected. 
Um, one of those things is I never would have expected to pursue a higher degree than, than college at Crown. You know, I, was, I thought I was done writing papers at 22, and that was just not the case. I'm, a, I'm currently a seminary student at Fuller Seminary. I'm 25 courses into a 30-course Master of Divinity program. I'm going to graduate in June, praise God, <laughs> because I am so done um, with senioritis and all those things. But God has really worked in this, in this um, extended graduate school journey that I've been on. And my prayer going into it is something I alluded to at the beginning, something I'm going to ask of you guys to consider as well, is that, is that the knowledge that is gained through study of God's word does not stay knowledge, but that it transforms into love. Okay? God is so valuable of our love and adoration. God is so deeply worthy of every little bit that I can do. And I liken it to my, uh, my relationship with my wife. The more that I learn about her in our years of marriage, the more that that leads me to love her and love the different aspects of her, just the different quirky things that pop up. And um, if, if I only added head knowledge in that, it wouldn't be beautiful <laughs> in the same way that it would be love. And so I want to challenge you guys. I know you're drinking from the fire hose. I actually heard Maddie say this. Um, and I just want you guys to know that take in as much as you can, transform it to love. Transform it to love. Admire God. Okay? Admire God because he's worthy of it and love him because he's worried, worthy of it. Um, I bring a perspective to scripture that is not uncommon uh, among different um, pastors and theologians and things like that. But for your guys' information, I bring a real kind of missional focus to scripture. I look at scripture as if it's trying to do something. I believe the whole Bible is, is centered on the story of Jesus and even more specifically on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I believe all the Old Testament talks about it. I believe the rest of the New Testament refers back to it. And uh, the book of John is just a beautiful book. I, I chose it for a few different reasons. One, because if the whole Bible is pointing toward Jesus, then the book that's all about his life is probably really important. <laughs> um, also, I chose John because it's different from all the other Gospels. So we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is a big word that means similar. That, that a lot of what they have going on in their Gospels are going to be word for word or phrase for phrase repeated in the other Gospels. John goes a little bit different direction in the way that he writes his book. And he uses things like analogies and he uses different stuff like that in order to convey a point. Me personally, I really like the poetic and, and um, pointed, maybe philosophical language that John uses. I think that it has a lot of power behind it. And so that's kind of why I wanted to choose that one. I got a quick photo of my wife and my two children. This is uh, Tatiana. She's from El Salvador. Um, I met her <laughs> through Rick Bunchu, who I'm internally grateful for. Um, she was working for Compassion International in El Salvador as a translator. Rick was visiting his kid in El Salvador, and uh, they got along super well. And Rick invited her to come to Kauai to speak in like 2013. I fell in love in the first moment that I seen her up on stage at church, and she needed a lot of convincing to <laughs> fall in love with me. Um, but God really wrote our story and took care of us. We had, there, there's a lot there as far as marrying someone from another country. She was separated and had to live in her country for 16 months while we were married doing paperwork. It was a nightmare. Um, but now that's all behind us, and we got little Amelia, and we got baby Liam. And, uh, I, you know, you guys will be seeing these guys around on Sunday. Please go and say hello. She loves meeting people and hanging out. Um, she's the best. Cool. Well, let's talk about some goals for the course of the Book of John. 
Goal number one, get to know Jesus. Okay? I really like historical um, movies and TV shows because I like to watch what people went through in their current day and time. I really enjoy um, to watch how Jesus walked through life, and I, and I like to play it as a movie in my mind. I really enjoy immersing myself into the story and trying to live it like it's the first time that it ever happened. To me, that, that makes the scriptures really come alive. And uh, since Jesus is such a big deal, <laughs> since he's such a big deal to Christianity, it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and make sure that you know the main character, that you know the things that he likes, you know the things that he hates, you see the way that he spends his time, you watch if he's okay being interrupted by things or if he's really like strict and on a schedule. <laughs> But get to know Jesus through this reading of John. We talked about this already. Growing knowledge that turns into love. Next one I want to talk about is examining scripture. So if, if I had a, a huge diamond, could I borrow this please? Mm -hmm. If I, <laughs> I ask as I'm grabbing it. Um, <laughs> if I had a diamond that was this big, okay, and I'm looking at it, you could look at it for a long time because it's really pretty. But then if you put it up to the light and you let the light come through it, it's going to show you something. If you, if you kind of pull it over here, if you're kind of looking at the top, bottom, what we want to do with the Bible is we want to examine it like it is a diamond. We want to get different angles, different perspectives, and we want to allow the living Word of God to be alive. Right? As we read through the book of John, we're going to be looking at it in different perspectives. I alluded a little bit. We're going to have an uh, academic perspective to it. We will talk about some of the Greek words that are key in the book. We're going to talk about um, how it connects with, with theology. But we're also going to look at it as, wow, what could this truth mean for my life today? And it's a different angle in looking at the diamond but both are essential and really important. Um, in this class, we're going to read through the entire book together. Um, you, you can read it on your own, but we will be reading every verse of the book of John while we meet here together and doing some discussion. Um, I'm going to bring my preparation to the discussion and fill in gaps where maybe we're not touching on different things. Um, I obviously cannot answer every question about the book of John. There's a lot of mystery that's involved in the Bible. And yet we're going to do our best to answer those questions and to go through the book slowly. So this course is not going to be purely technical and purely like giving you a bunch of scholarly work on John, but it's going to be something where we walk through it together. And, uh, and we read every single verse, and we consider these different things. So structure for the class, we're, you can pre-read if you like. We're going to read here, discuss, then fill in the gaps. Um, there will be some pop quizzes. I'll probably give you a quiz on Friday when I'm with you guys again. Um, I'm not going to give you a grade or like hit you on the hand with a ruler if you don't get it, but there will be some sweet candy incentives. I see that we already got something like that going on. Um, as we get into a book about the Bible, I want to talk about some things about the Bible. These might be understood and simple. You're like, dude, I signed up for a Bible college. I know what's going on, okay? But I want to lay some groundwork on the Bible. Does anyone ever feel intimidated picking up the Bible and reading? Okay, a few of you guys. Some of you guys are like, oh yeah, it feels fairly familiar. I'll be honest, in, in my years of formal schooling and in my age and, and in studying and doing daily devotions and things like that, if someone were to come to me and say, hey, I want you to give a message on the book of Isaiah, the beginning chapters, I would be intimidated. The Bible's complex. It's full of cultural understandings. It can be something that, that maybe you don't open up certain books because you feel like there's no way that you're actually going to be able to understand what's going on. And the truth is, when we call that out, hey, the Bible is meant to be read. 
Okay? Don't let anyone ever tell you that you can only understand the Bible if you understand everything about context. You can read and understand the Bible no matter what with no context at all. Context will help. It will help you unlock. But the question I pose is at what point is understanding of context enough to get to truth? Let me unpack this for a second, okay? Um, think about the book of Romans that was written to the Roman church. Think about the first moment in which the church leader of Rome opens up this beautiful letter from Paul, and it's very long, it's very theologically technical, it's very intense, okay? Think about the first moment in which he opens up that letter and begins to talk about what, what's written, okay? When he does that, there's going to be all sorts of different people in the crowd. We're in Rome, we're in the first, you know, 100 years A.D., and the people, the church in Rome was wildly diverse. Okay, you would have slaves that might be from what we would call England. They might be from Asia, <laughs> might be from Africa, and they would be under the oppression of the Roman rule. You might have politicians that are there. In fact, these are all kind of people that are mentioned at the end of the book of Romans. You're going to have people that are wealthy. You're going to have people that are poor. You're going to have citizens. You're going to, not only with that, you're going to have children, right? They're five or six years old. They're only going to understand so much from the letter of Romans. You're going to have people that are scholars, that are very smart and intelligent and well thought out. You're going to have people that have very little education. And yet, there's a tendency in the academic culture to say that Everyone in the Church of Rome would have understood the context of this. I'm here to say people that heard the book of Romans heard it right where they were at, and God was able to work through that in the first reading, similarly to how he can do that with us today, even being in a 21st century, westernized, secularized, individualized culture. Okay? Does that make sense? I want to dispel right off the bat this idea that you cannot understand Scripture because it's, because it's so complex and it deals with another culture and it does all these things. Hey, the Bible is alive and active. The Bible can do whatever it wants. When you feed on the Bible, and I mean that by meditation and intake and, and stewing with it and digesting it slowly, when you feed on the Bible, God will move, okay? Now, that being said, context is nice <laughs> because it does help us out. We're going to get some background, and I bet for some of you guys, it was part of the reason of wanting to come to this Bible college at all was to get more context of what's going on in the Bible, <laughs> to get some understanding about those things. Number two, the Bible is authoritative. What that means, it it is meant to be a safeguard for the church and for our lives. When the Bible says something, it doesn't matter what we feel about that thing. We put it as the authority over our lives. Okay? As Christians, this is very, very important to get to. The Bible is reliable, it's beautiful, it's historical, it's got so much going on. But one thing I want to talk about, it is authoritative. I might have different ideas of what I think about popular morals. But you know what? I sacrifice those things to go with what the Bible says. Because I actually really don't trust myself all that much. <laughs> My mind flips and flops over the dumbest little things. I don't know if I want a burger or if I want a burrito for lunch. And I will argue with myself. To have the Bible be authoritative is something that brings me a lot of peace because I'm able to follow with something that fits. Next one. It is pure truth. And I, I'm here to say that nothing else in this world is purely true. Our thoughts aren't purely true. Our laws as a society are not purely true. 
Different philosophies, man, people are poking holes in them. The Bible is pure truth. What else is pure in this world? What a beautiful thing to be able to feed on. I believe the Bible wants to be known. The same Holy Spirit that wrote the Bible is the Holy Spirit that lives in you. God will speak through his word. Then this last one, commentaries are great, but first do the work. It's good to hear about what scholars say about it, but first read it with your eyes. Don't go to someone else. Do not put a scholar that is going to be the in-between between you and God. Let God speak first as to what the Bible is all about. Okay, we're doing good here. What else do we got? Um, you guys may be familiar with the Bible Project. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and play this. I don't think the audio is going to work very well um, because I think it's just going to be off my computer. Oh, it is going. All right, let's watch this. And he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John, the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later book as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly defined with a clear purpose that he states. John says, the story is written so that you may come Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John believes that the Jesus we read about in this book is alive and real, and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is truly cool. It first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story, and it's followed by the next big block of story about Jesus performing miraculous signs to generate a creature controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign. Creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half. Cool. That um, is a great resource on YouTube. Has anyone ever watched a Bible Project video before? Very nice. I would encourage you guys, anyone that comes through and is teaching on a book of the Bible, f to watch that video. It's pretty quick, and for me, it helps to map out what's going on in the story to see it straight up, and then you can kind of get into the details of it as well. Um, but we're going to get into it, and that was a, kind of a nice little intro to that. Let's see if we can get to the next one. Cool. Things to think about specifically with the Gospel of John, genre, okay? Sometimes we, we read the Bible and we think that it is like most of the other books that we read at school, okay? If you guys think about your, you know, in high school when you were there, think about your biology book, okay? When you open up that biology book, yeah, they tried to make it interesting, but it wasn't, <laughs> right? And it had a bunch of facts. Fact, 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 fact. And you would learn by reading through the facts that were already studied, that were already presented. Okay? That's a genre, that's a textbook. The Bible is oftentimes equated to being a biology book. While there are truths through Scripture that talk about the reality of life. The Bible is a theological book, not a textbook. The Bible is, some people call it instructions. Well, yes and no. It's, it's a theological book. And you have many different genres inside of that book. The best way I can equate it to you is this. If I'm texting someone, I'm using a certain drive of my language. If I'm writing the lyrics to a song, I would be using words in a different manner, right? If I'm drafting an email for business, I'm using a certain way of saying things. If I'm writing a novel that reflect, reflects Christian morals and ideals, I'm doing that in a different way. 
if I'm writing a personal love letter to my wife, that should probably be taken differently than if I'm writing a song about my anger and frustration, right? People are deeply capable of using words in different driving forces. And it's important with every single book of the Bible that you figure out what is the driving force of the author? What are they trying to do here? Are they writing poetry? Are they, are they speaking prophetically? Are they putting down a bunch of fortune cookie um, wisdom sayings in a block? Are they, are they retelling history? What are they doing? Genre for John is a gospel narrative. Narrative means story. That John uses this as a story in which he is going to unpack through a bunch of different things this, this revelation of like you were there. John will use a few things in the narrative. He will use people's dialogue to communicate a story. Jesus will be quoted in what he's saying on a lot of his teachings. He will use situations that the narrator will describe. Think about a healing where he says, Jesus reached down, took some mud, spit in it, put it on the person's eyes, and they were healed. He will use narrative asides, they're called, in which whoever's narrating will give some context to it. And they'll say, for Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> that comes from a perspective of a narrator who's giving additional information because they know it. Okay? And then, of course, just the flow and the feels and the settings and, and who they're talking to and the name of someone comes up and you find out that, it, that it's a Canaanite woman. What is the social impact of those things? So we already talked about the one versus three a little bit. I want to open up the book of John here. It would be kind of a shame to get through our first lecture on John without actually opening the book. I want to look to John chapter 21, verses 20. I believe this is where the author introduces himself into the book. I think it's worthy of being read because if we're going to read a story from someone and if they choose to include some information about them, it's going to be important in us knowing what, what driving force is going behind them, right? Um, who has it and who can read it for me? Verses 20 to the end of the book, please. Yes. Thank you. So the introduction is that the one that's writing this is the same guy that is the disciple that Jesus loved, the guy that was leaning against, you know, the, the chest of Jesus during the Last Supper communion, and that is this guy that's kind of talked about the end of his life in these mysterious terms to Peter, okay? Whenever I get to a book and I'm looking at who's the author of the book, there are lots of different theories of academics that love to write lots of pages about these kinds of things. Me, personally, I kind of take it in the, in the simplest one that makes the most sense. And I would say that the author of this is John, John the Disciple. James and John, sons of Zebedee. And um, honestly, when it comes down to it, still scripture, it's still authoritative, regardless of who wrote it. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of cool that they make an introduction like that. Also, there's a, there's a thesis in the book of John. Can we get someone else to read John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31? Please do. I got, I got a guy. Thank you, though. Beautiful. So what did that say? What, what was the reason this was written? That we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
that we might believe. Does this book have an angle to it? Absolutely. This book is written that people that might read it might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Is there a bias that's written with this book? Yeah, they want people to believe. <laughs> they want people to hear these stories and be like, whoa. <laughs> so that's what happened with that guy. That's why that was such a big deal. Cool. Last thing, structure the book. You guys saw the, the way that the Bible Project kind of set it up. I set it up a little bit differently. Um, the prologue, first 18 verses. Book of Signs would be chapter 1 to 12, the rest of 1 to 12. The book of the glory or passion, it's really interesting that he would take seven or eight chapters and talk about the final week of Jesus' life. It's a lot of time spent in a 21-chapter book. Then the epilogue, chapter 21, that's kind of tailed on to the end there. Cool. Do I have any more? I do. We'll, we'll finish up here pretty quick, but I just want to say a couple little themes here of John that we're going to see. I, I told you guys that John has kind of some flower, flower-y language that he gets into some um, really interesting symbols and poetic nature of things. And I really enjoy that. Some of the dualisms that he talks about would be light and darkness, above and below, life and death, truth and lies, sight and blindness. Etc. He uses these things to speak to more than just the physical of it. Then we got some big I am statements in the book of John as well, where Jesus himself says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Jesus is bold. The things that he says are, are really intense, and uh, I'm really looking forward to getting into the book with you guys. I can leave that up if you guys are still um, jotting some of that down. But we're going to get to it. We're going to open up John chapter 1 in the epilogue. I don't know if we'll get through the whole thing on Friday, but I'm with you guys Friday again at 10 a.m. We're going to get to it. I would ask you if you'd like to. If you got some devotional time between now and then, maybe focus on that. Start unpacking it for yourself. Um, we will get together. We'll read it in here. We'll do some discussion in here. Again, I'll bring some of the things that I'm studying about it to the table in our discussion, and we'll have, we'll have a good time getting that done on Wednesday. But any questions about anything that we covered today? Yes? I have one on truth. Um, I know you said that, you're, you, that Scripture obviously has to do truth as well. Do you believe that is no. Okay. Because scripture in itself says God's invisible qualities are seen in his creation around us. Um, I do believe it's the most reliable source of truth. Even as we study creation around us, it's not nearly as articulate as the gospel message. Um, I, I also believe... Oh, this is a little controversial, but I believe that you can find truth from man-made things as well. Um, say a television show that you watch that some of the messages really spoke deeply to you. But I don't believe that those are new truths. I believe they're recycled truths from God's truth. Um, and again, all those things, less reliable. You know, you got to take them to Scripture. It's great that we have truth to kind of sieve through and, and see what sticks? It's a deep question. First question off the bat. It's, wow. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, how many times have you gone through John before? Yeah, a bunch. Um, I definitely had a... <laughs> um, I, I've had multiple New Testament courses. I've also had a Book of John course in my undergrad. I had a Book of John course that I recently finished in my graduate work that was actually in the Greek, which was gnarly. I do not speak Greek or know it very well, but um, we got guided through how to dig up some Greek 
um, in it, and that was really rad. Um, but and I just I love to read it. I think that John, First John, Second John, Third John are just so beautiful as well. Um, kind of in the same camp of writing and things like that. So I couldn't give you a definitive answer. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I'd probably put the emotion right with the thesis of this is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. I think that the emotion comes with like revelation, um, but also like a, a revealing of Jesus that is kind of like a best friend that you never knew you had. Um, so I think it's, it's like a familiar revelation. <laughs> Anything else? Cool. I appreciate you guys. Please find me um, if you ever want to chat about things outside of class, things are going on. I want to just close this in a word of prayer, and then we'll dismiss you guys to get ready for your next block, all right? God, we love you, and we're grateful for um, your word here. Lord, I just really want to pray over these students that as we begin you know, to get in, and to really get into the chapters here, Lord, and study this book. Lord, would you reveal things to us? Would you reveal things not just in knowledge but to our lives? Lord, and I just want to place just a seal over each and every one of their hearts and minds in the Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that they will just be focused and, and continuing in pursuit of your goodness, Lord, and of your understanding. Pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys. You guys are dismissed.